was the night before Christmas and all through the house. Not exactly. It wasn't a house. It was a car. My mom, my dad, my younger brother and I had been renting a house in a safe neighborhood, but on this night, we were about to be homeless again. Things changed when our old car finally broke down completely. My dad had to be able to get to work, the only work he could find as a janitor at a discount store, so we had to spend the rent money on another clunker. You see, my parents started out as middle-class, white-collar, working homeowners who sold their first home to buy a bigger second one in a nicer neighborhood for their family, the American dream. But when my dad was laid off from his job the year I turned seven, we lost that home and my parents never regained their economic footing. After that, we moved roughly every year to rent a new house. Once each lease was up and we hadn't paid faithfully, we would be evicted, scrabble together whatever we could to pay back rent and barely make it to the next lesser place. Now though, as we talk, I am a published author, marketing professional, and out lesbian. I'm also not homeless, so as the It Gets Better project says, it gets better. And for me, it all came down to coming out. So today I'm going to tell you two stories from my life and give you four S steps I've learned to apply to all types of coming out. In fact, I'm going to suggest that you should all come out too. First, let's get a few things straight about coming out as LGBT. The very concept that someone needs to come out and tell her orientation to relative strangers and strange relatives is an odd one on the surface. After all, people don't normally go around asking each other who they love or want, right? But that's exactly it. They don't. Because society defaults to the assumption that everyone is straight. Coming out, therefore, means becoming visible. As Dr. Robert Eichberg, author of Coming Out, An Act of Love, and one of the founders of National Coming Out Day said, it is imperative that we come out and let people know who we are and disabuse them of their fears and stereotypes. Historically, most cultures have assigned such shame and invisibility to just being gay that coming out is a necessary moment of self-empowerment and finding one's tribe. And when one chooses her own time, and is accepted for who she is. That can have lasting physical and psychological benefits. According to a recent University of Montreal study, coming out is no longer a matter of popular debate, but of public health. This study looked at 87 LGBT 25-year-olds and found those who were out to others had lower levels of the stress hormone cortisol and fewer symptoms of anxiety, depression, and burnout less burnout, <laughs> anyone, now I've got your attention. I would argue anyone can achieve similar benefits by sharing a pivotal personal moment with someone and seeing that person grow from it. This is even more true if the story is one that carries shame for you and shouldn't. Like, say, your experience with poverty, homophobia, abuse, mental illness, racism or any of the other isms. Leave shame, take pride. While LGBT coming out is a particularly intense, often life or death form of storytelling, it is still that, sharing a personal story. Telling the stories that made us is vital to everything from personal to corporate growth. According to a recent Harvard Business Review article that drew from multiple corporate inclusiveness studies, when people hear stories that feel representative, it creates a vehicle for nuanced conversations, which are what truly drive change. Stories invite perspective taking, the concept of standing in someone else's shoes and imagining what it's like to be them. Lasting change is not possible if we don't share our most important stories if we don't come out to each other. For now, let's get back to the first of my two stories where I'm a homeless teenager trying to come out of poverty. In the 1980s, the Midwest experienced its biggest drought in years and the effects of a politically driven grain embargo that left to rot 
the very corn and soybeans that had been put up by the farmers to get through just such a weather event. And our little town in Iowa was left to rot right along with it. My parents moved west to the Rockies in hopes of finding work. What actually happened was that we ended up homeless and sleeping in our old car at rest stops with our cats. <laughs> four cats, four humans, one compact car. It was summer. <laughs> you get the idea. Eating nacho cheese soup cold from a can, I cannot recommend. Nor could I eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with joy again for many years. I, I love them now, though. When we were first homeless, my dad reached out to every possible source for help, finding a kind woman who owned a motel by the highway and who would let us stay in their, one of their larger rooms for free initially, and then later charged us a much reduced rate. So there's S takeaway number one on how to come out of poverty or anything else. Seek help. My dad found work milking cows for $2 an hour, and eventually the custodial job I mentioned earlier, which paid just enough for us to be dropped from welfare and food stamps, but not enough for us to really make it as a family of four. In 2019, 6.3 million Americans were among the working poor, according to data from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. Just as is true of many working poor parents today, even with all these challenges, my parents never gave up. I watched the circumstances make them sad, mad, and ashamed in turn. But they never forgot to keep pushing forward. And they never forgot to count each blessing we received. So that's S takeaway number two. Stay strong. That December, we were several months behind on rent and had been given a three-day eviction notice in the week leading up to Christmas. Nice, right? Well, nearly 1.4 million Americans this September were expecting to be evicted from their homes within the last quarter of this year. So this is still an unfortunate reality for many. And just like them, that Christmas at age 17, I was packing my stuff yet again, for I knew not where. I stood at the window of my bedroom, snow falling outside, racking my brains for a way to solve our problem. I wondered then if we would end up back sleeping in our car, but this time in the cold. Perhaps because of youthful optimism, this was the first time in my life that I thought failure might be the only option left to us. I knew our best hope was to go back to that motel. I'd go back to riding the bus to school every day and getting out a stop away, then walking slowly so no one would see me turning in at the motel. I had a few close friends, and they knew some of what I was going through, and they all faithfully kept my secret. Though our house was often chilly, that night my bedroom was warm. Crying, I pressed my face to the cold, foggy glass, trying to force out the thoughts of what might become of us. I whispered fiercely, no, no way is this how I end up. I took a deep breath and let it out as I finger-painted my name, huge on the wet glass, pressing so hard I thought I would break it. The letters ran in droplets down to the frame, but anyone could see that I had been there. I was making my mark, proving I am, and that I would continue to be, that I would make it through. As we come out of this pandemic and the economic crisis it has made or made worse for so many families, nearly one in seven American children lived in poverty in 2019, and that's pre-pandemic. I want you to know that you will make it. Even if you lose a home, lose someone dear to you, you do not have to lose yourself. Seek help, someone will be there. Like my time living in a motel, the help may not be what you think you need or deserve, but it will somehow get you through. You have to believe in the beauty that lies beyond this moment for you, and you can make it your new reality. Now, it's called creative visualization, and it's used by top athletes and high performers of all kinds. Then, I'd never heard of such a thing. But that's what I was doing that night by the window, making eye contact with future me, seeing myself happy on the other side of that window, on the other side of that moment. However blurry or seemingly impossible, you have to have a vision for your life, which is S takeaway number three. 
see your way forward. So how do you find a vision for your life? Start by finding the things you're good at. Take notice of those who have become what you want to be and ask them how they did it. Then plan your next few steps. You don't need to foresee your whole life path, just enough to know that there is more than this. In my case, my love of reading and writing led me to become a novelist and poet. And along the way, I found I was good at marketing, and this thrilled the analytical side of my brain. Through my work as an author, and here today, I'm fulfilling the last S takeaway. Share your story. So the four S's to coming out of any kind are seek help, stay strong, see your way forward, and share your story. The best way that I can demonstrate all of these is by telling you that one last story, my coming out story. When someone comes out as LGBT, particularly if they do so within a family or religion or culture or region of the world, where just being who they are is considered wrong or a sin, there is often a sitting at the window moment, just before they write their name on the glass, break through, and get moving again on their path. There is also a lot of emotional pain, soul searching, and doubt of oneself and of others that leads up to that moment. All of that was true for me. I was raised in a fundamentalist home. When I realized I was lesbian in college, everything I'd been brought up to believe screamed that claiming my lesbian identity would mean spiritual doom. This, along with dancing, alcohol, rated R movies, and excessive use of the word gosh. Back then, I believe these were all sins. I internalized this relentless guilt, and it nearly consumed me. I hated myself for wanting what and whom I wanted. I tried to change who I was, but the simplest way to say it is, gosh darn it, <laughs> being straight is just not natural for me. I realized over the course of many depressed and sleepless nights that I was expected to choose doctrine and society over my own truth and chance at real happiness. But at last, just like at that window a few years earlier, I chose myself on my own path. To say that I felt a great spiritual weight lifted would be a massive understatement. I was a new person. I was indeed saved. As an English major on a full academic scholarship at a conservative religious university, I made the brilliant decision to come out at a campus poetry competition <laughs> by reading an original poem that included obvious content about same-sex love. And no one missed the point. <laughs> about half the place looked horrified. Uh, others stood in support. I did not lose my scholarship, and I still won the competition. I lost no friends that day. In fact, many LGBT classmates came out to me. And I got invited to a hell of a lot of great parties I wouldn't have known about otherwise. And now, I'm here talking to you. And my evangelical mother is delighted that I've been spending so much time lately with this guy named Ted. <laughs> Many LGBT youth, though, are not so lucky. Being poor and lesbian and in an unaccepting environment, coming out was a major risk for me. I could easily have become a statistic. Like me, 20 to 40% of America's homeless youth identify as LGBT. This 20 to 40% number is made even more staggering by the fact that LGBT people make up only 5 to 10% of the population. And many of these, of course, become homeless after coming out. Gay and transgender youth are also 8.4 times more likely to attempt suicide if they are rejected by their families. And it's even worse for youth of color. A separate study of LGB youth in New York by the American Journal of Public Health found that minority race or ethnicity was associated with a significantly increased risk of suicide attempts in youth versus their white counterparts. And as if those figures weren't bad enough, right? And these are the ones that we know about, the ones who were out to someone. Imagine how many more there are who forever hold their peaceless silence. This is what happens when we think we are the only one with a story like ours. 
Just as was the case for me when I was living in poverty, it is a soul-crushing thing to live your life in any kind of hiding, never really able to say, this is me, this is who I am, this is my story. But as that Harvard Business Review article concluded, it's the exchange of human experiences via stories that tends to inspire lasting change for people on a personal level. Now, I wouldn't be a good marketer if I didn't end this talk with a clear call to action. What is it that I want you to do? Well, maybe this talk will lead you to support or start a group that aims to solve one of the problems I called out. That would be great. But above all else, I want you to come out. Share a story that has made you with someone today, even one someone, as I have with you, and ask people for theirs. Leave shame and take pride together. When times get tough, most of us tend to hide. As a born introvert, trust me, I still do. So make it a point every day not to hide the most important things about you, your talents, your struggles, the story of who you are. Someone needs to hear it. Come out, join the party, and life and love will be there to meet you. What's your story? Thank you.